Good evening, guys. Welcome back to the Malaysia Architecture Education Online Series, proudly presented by MASA. Hope you guys are doing well, and thank you for joining us tonight. So for those who are new to MASA, MASA is Malaysia Architecture Student Alliance and is a non-profit student committee acting directly under PEM, which is the Pertubahan Architect Malaysia, consisting of student representatives from all architecture institutes in Malaysia. During this time, MASA and PAM have decided to launch this online lecture series for students to be more productive and gain more insight. Architect Adrianta is the head of PAM Education and Dr. Zach Zairul is the convener. My name is Iris, a MASA representative from UCSI University and I'll be your MC for today. So tonight's topic will be Charter, Sustainability, Building and Neighborhood Design in Tropical Countries. Our speaker for tonight will be A.R. Alice Leong. So her achievement and experience are so spectacular. I will tell you all of it, so bear with me. She graduated from USM with a double degree, which is Bachelor of Science HBP in Architecture and Bachelor of Architecture. She's currently a manager and a practicing architect for 16 years at Architect MEA Sandir Bahad. She's a professional architect registered with the Board of Architect Malaysia and a qualified GBI facilitator in Malaysia. Currently, she's in the technical committee of GBI and council member of Pertubahan Architect Malaysia. Before this, she was a honorary secretary of PAM and also honorary secretary of Malaysia Green Building Council. She's also a former GBI's board of director. She's appointed by PAM as a representative and committee member in Arcasia and ACSGA. She's also appointed by International Unions of Architects as SDG Commission, Committee of Region 4. Air Ellis is a qualified professional interior designer registered with LUM and member of MIID. Recently, she has obtained her accredited building inspector qualification with Palm Architect Center and also qualified herself as arbitrator under Palm panel in 2019. She's actively involved in many various projects where green and sustainability elements are mostly implemented in the design and living spaces of the projects. From the introduction itself, we can acknowledge that uh, A.R. Ellis is an amazing architect and also she has a lot of experience. I think we believe that uh, we all admire her passion in this job and in this industry. So it is our honour to have this chance to invite her as our guest speaker for tonight. So Thank everyone you. sit back and relax. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. Oh. But if you have any questions during the sharing, feel free to type them Do down in the chat box so we can attend to them at the end of the sharing. All right, so without further ado, I would like to invite A.R. Ellis. Hi, A.R. Ellis. Hi, Iris. Hi, so I'll pass it down to you. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Um, good evening to all the uh, students. Uh, and thank you to Masa to organize this uh, wonderful online talk here. Uh, I've been knowing that a few talks uh, has been done before with different topics. And uh, today, my topics is trying to share it with you uh, in deep about the uh, sustainable buildings guides. I think it's about 30 guidelines. Uh, it's good enough, not just for students, but also for architects in your practice. You can use it basically for the rest of your life, you know, if you practice an architect. And um, this uh, information is not just uh, created by anybody. Uh, it's through many platforms that I've been uh, interacts with different architects from not just uh, locally, uh, but also for the uh, internationally. So I happen to met uh, people from the U UN Habitats and, and, uh, and that's how they're able to share it. I think it's a wonderful and this, uh, all the guidelines are just perfectly for the tropical country. So let's go ahead with that. Okay, that's it. This study guideline is as good for you to do your design in construction and using the green building elements efficiently and also planning a more greener neighborhoods. So that's how we're moving forward into the sustainable development goals 
you know, uh, if you haven't heard of the sustainable development goals, they are consist of 17 goals. But today we are not touching this because I'm going to do a very quick uh, guidelines just for uh, good enough for all of you to do the design of this. So first of all is, uh, sorry. Okay, the site analysis, context, topography, and cli climate data. Even though it sounds like very general, but it happens to be that a lot of people uh, during study times, they will remember that, but somehow or rather, this thing has been slowly, uh, I found it has been leaving all the architects when the movement, especially when come up to work. I think simply it's because times uh, is, uh, is part of the reason that when you will start to work, people will ask you to be very fast speed output, whatever it is, and you have then you tend to be totally forget about all these basic criteria that are guiding you through in the design. And this is actually a very important context, topography, climate. So people always uh, choosing for uh, which site to go with. Either you go for a green fields or go for a brown fields. Of course, you're going for green fields. Uh, it's a lot easier, a lot easier because it's green and the land is already there. You know, you basically just clean out easily and then you just start it off, you know. It's flexible, it's cheaper and uh, avoid a lot of some furthermore, it somehow this kind of site somehow will be a bit a bit away from the from the residents, you know. So then uh but that is another uh, con in the site that you will create a pressure to the environment. So the increase of the pop and also of the uh, pollutions, you know. So the environment pressure means that you the ecology itself is, um, you know, is, is, is already balanced in a sense, but when the moment you go into the site and then you start to clean out all the, the site with the trees and whatever it is, and you affect the ecologies. That's how now you can see a lot of these so-called flash, uh, the, 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 the flooded happen in sub sudden mm -hmm. after a, a very heavy storms, you know. So this is not the, the, the good things about it. And versus about the brown field, what is brown field? Brown field is, uh, you can see from, uh, from my screen here, the brown field can be a site has been abandoned, used to be industry areas or uh, a garbage areas where all the, all around Malaysia's garbage has been thrown to one side. And then after a while, they found it a bigger site, then they abandoned the site. Or it can be a, uh, a, a site that used to be do other things that not meant for building. So one after a while that this site will become a so-called a brown field. So people were asking, brownfield um, is, is the challenge, is the brownfield areas, last time in the history, they maybe is not very crowded by, by, by the surrounding, but somehow now, but because things has been developed, so a lot of brownfield site has been to be around the city's area. So people are versus this kind of thing. So you can see that you, you, you want to clear the brown site, you will request a higher risk cost and longer construction time because you do not know what you're discovered in this site. It may be a lot of surprise, a lot of challenges, you know, you might spend a lot more time and equipment to clean up all the site. So in terms of uh, giving back the incentive and all these things, right, I think the local authority, other country has been doing that. They've been giving the planning permission means the authority approval a lot easier to obtain. And then it's also helped in the sense of the economic transformations. Means the site, rather than abandoned in such a way, but at the same time, now you change it into some uh, commercial areas or livable areas, so that is called economic transformation. So I think if we are talking about moving to the, uh, the green and more sustainable way, this is one of the things that we cannot give it up. We have to really look into the, the site itself. So another one is to assess to the local context. That includes the topography, because flat lands do not have a topography problem, so it's a lot easier for you to plan with. But if you have a site that with the um, slopes and at this policy, you affect the assess to get the sun and also the view. Because when you want to do a, create a, 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 a green, greener buildings, right, then you will talk about all this, you know. So then the collect data and on the temperatures, relative humidity, wind speeds and directions, all these things are, have to be collected because we are talking about designing a greener buildings around the, the climates, uh, tropical climates area. So all these things we cannot uh, overlook, even though when you come up to practice an architect, you know, the temperatures, how you get it, you can go to search, check with certain departments, you can get this information. I know the engineers are doing that because they need to get the amount of the water rains, whatever. So it is also our duty to find out if you do not know how to get it, you can ask your 
consultants around that provide you such information. And then the wind speed, everything is important because that in Malaysia is the uh, good in the sense that um, we have a sun uh, almost 365 days and then the wind speeds uh, depends on each of the locations. Sometimes you can get this kind of free, free wind ventilations into your building. I've done projects that we created the ships and everything and now the foyer itself you stand there, you can feel the wind breeze is like 24 hours without stopping. So, so that is a very pleasant. So uh, when you talk about green, as an architect, we always emphasize on passive design. Passive design is what that means, passive. Passive is you harvest the nature resources around and such as the sunlight, the winds and all this to enhance the building. So that are the free resources to help you into your design. Then it help you to cut down certain, uh, reduces certain uh, costs into the building rather than it's spent for uh, human made or so artificials, uh, so-called ventilations come to help you. So those are come with the cost and then you need some space also to think of how to actually to accommodate. The next one is the, 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 to establish a bioclimate charge so that you know that you're using data, so everything, it helps you in terms of the design. So the next one is the building footprint. It seems uh, it's a very uh, simple logic and uh, simple word as well, but people tend to forget that. When you have a site, if you realize that, if, especially in residential lands area, your neighbors normally will do the extension as much as they can to the boundary, even though it's a little, uh, it's, it's legal sense in terms of the statutories. But why there is always a reason that you need a setback? Setback in terms of the sense that, as I said on the, on the, on the screen, you can say that your lens coverage right, cannot more than 60%. The, 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 the lesser the coverage itself is actually at the same time it cut down and reduces the ecology footprints. So what do you mean by carbon footprints and all this thing? Carbon footprints is actually every activities that we do created the carbons. So uh, you, you can see at the bottom of my screen is uh, the moment you do construction, you do your operations and manufacture from one item transport to another I, uh, areas to one uh, you know, procurement from every from nothing to become something, all this process is actually required the carbon. So all this carbon, so called the carbon, is actually created the um, the what you call that the, the the global climate change and all these things are all very negative. That's why right now I think from um, this year in the beginning of the year that uh, when we are still having the previous ministries and they have been launching this called uh, LCC's um, challenge of 2030. LCC means a low carbon footprint city. So there's been a select a few local authorities to actually to look up into their, their areas, their districts, to make sure that all the developments happens in within the authorities' control are all compliance to the low carbon footprint. So when people mention about low carbon footprints, then you know that what it does it mean that the low carbon footprint. Every movement, every activity that you do is actually consists of carbon. So we want to reduce this kind of unnecessary uh, activities that at the same time you cut, uh, cut down the, the, the carbons. There's a way of calculation that, but today I'm not going to, to touch about it. There's more, even uh, more technicals. So we always remember when you get a piece of site that you have to construct something, you make sure that you definitely have to leave out certain percentage to the open area. Simply, as I said uh, uh, just now, uh, you will affect the ecologies. Imagine the site itself is already like a small little eco world there and there is uh there are trees there are all different habitats and the rain falls it go down to the earth and then it come back it's all go very smoothly as it is the moment you start to construct something you affected the entire of the ecologies so how to bring back with this that's how that this plot ratio the footprint itself is a guide to you and all the material that use it for the hard surface everything it has to be specially chosen so that's why we will encourage people to reduce the footprints at the same time you have you all the building shapes form that you can see from the, uh, the left of the screen itself. That's how you arrange yourself to play around with the footprints, building shapes and all these things to give back the, uh, the, the ground cover. So and this is seems very common to you that the building orientations, east, west, north, south, you know, but um, not many people, I mean, it's easier to say, I mean, for students, it's uh, always a lot of flexibilities that a lecturer will give you a piece of land or assignments, say, go to this, go to that side. You have the flexibilities to get all the orientation that you wish for. So normally people always choose a very good location that I'm, you know, my main facade, everything has to be faced. 
um, north south, you know, then the east west is trying to reduce. But in the actual practice, you do not have that kind of practice, uh, that kind of flexibilities. For instance, uh, when the side is given to you, unfortunately, the main facade or the longer facade is facing is, is facing the west or facing the east. So is that a doom to you? No. So you have to find a solution how to resolve that. So at the back of the guideline, then you can see what is the solutions for that. Really. So do not forget about the orientation. Uh, besides then the wind study is really benefit in the cells that when you come to design, when you choose the right orientation to plan your building shapes and layout everything, that indirectly already is a cost savings really. So you do not spend unnecessary times and costs and your efforts into something that you need to change. It's already like a free things that you design for that already. The next is your building shapes and the forms. Um, okay, since my topic is about the tropical climates, um, if you do realize that the the, the the, the climate change, the hot climates can be defined into two. You can define into the hot area and also the hot humids. What do you mean by the hot area? I go to the more extreme one. The hot area climate is normally that when the daytime or the summertime, you go really, really, really hot and it's become very, very, very dry. And when it comes to the uh, winter's time or cold season time, it will go for very, very cold and all these things. So the design for that is different from our hot, humid climate. So hot, arid climates normally happens in the areas like the uh, northeast of the India, because India is a huge country, they're facing this kind of problem. Uh, they have different climates, it depends on which part of you are talking about. And then some areas like the near to the Sahara Desert, daytime they are very hot, dry and all these things, but how you're going to survive, right? So the design make, does make the changes. So you see in the hot, humid climate country like Malaysia, we are, uh, the humidity is very high. So what we normally do is we will create the building in a longer shapes, you know, longer shapes because we want to get the long facade facing north south and then the east east west we try to make it uh, you know as, as as smaller facade as you can if you have a choice to do that kind of design so then you have to make sure that your 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 opening so the windows is there the crisscross ventilation is perfect you know then you are able to get uh, all the natural uh, resources like i said the lighting the winds and all this you know and then of course the material that you choose normally people choose for the lighter color the better you don't go for black black i mean we all study science before you know that the black is attract all the colors and get all the heats in you know, it, it makes a sense for the hot arid climates they are different in the ways really they have to do the building form shapes in more compact form more compact form and then uh preferably normally they will do a project in the center then all the openings around the building itself is very small and then also with shadings as well just like us in these shadings just in case they are in the hot day, uh, seasons, you know. So these are the reasons actually they want to attract the cold air, contain the cold air in the building and minimize the heat gain. You see, these two different climate, our, our target is still the same, that we want to minimize the heat gain. We want to get all the natural lighting and the ventilation into the building. So these are the similarity of the two different hot, humid and hot, every climate. The different, but the difference is the way that how you design it and how you treat the facade and the form of the building itself does make a difference. So uh, bottoms are how there's few ways that you can do it. As I said that if you are in a hot humid, then you can do the open, uh, you know, the, 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 let the wind cross, get as fast as natural ventilation cross around. But if you are different climates or country, then you have to do everything in more uh, compact uh, uh, designs really. The next is about, again, is how you allocate all the areas, you know. So in this one, I give you some example that how you create a buffer spaces. Uh, let's say you have a, a, a side piece of projects, a site given to you when you design. So you're trying to put all the area, I call it a buffer spaces, such as your staircases, the services areas, your leaf, your lobby, your kitchen, things that are just doing more on the services, you know, toilets, you know, to segregate. So these are the areas that we put it out for the east and the west. So the places that you're going to use it more, spend the time more like your living rooms, your your bedrooms or your, your family's areas and all these things. So these are the areas that we actually encourage uh, to put it facing the north and the south. So this is one of the way that actually you can locate the space within the building. The next one that I'm going to say is about the window opening versus the wall. It does make a, a, a very great impact of that. So we always have to make sure that the placements of the, 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 the numbers of the windows that you want to put it on the facade 
we make sure that it's more on the north south because the east west we know that where's the sunrise and sunset that's how it is you know it doesn't mean that we don't put there but we can there are other treatments so slowly you can see that the, the guidelines here is coming up uh, to tell you so one of this way one of the way is actually your fraud ratio of your opening versus uh, your wall versus the window so the lessons of the opening itself, then you will uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the tracks of the heat. Because in Malaysia, we, are, we want the light, we want the natural lighting, but we do not want the glare. At the same time, we, <clears throat> we don't want the, uh, the heat gain into the building because we are, uh, so-called we are, it's hot enough for us already. So we, when we go into one building, either it's a residential building or a commercial building, we want it to be cool. So when you do, if you want to use this concept, it is actually much more, uh, import, uh, more, more sensible for a passive design. <clears throat> but of course, when it comes to a commercial building, you can't avoid people start to design buildings um, using fully of glass. So there's uh, some guidelines over here that how you treat your glass also. Uh, and offices, I, I mean, we have done it before, many projects are doing that. So you still can a visual and then, a, but from outside, you can look the whole piece is still a glass. But how we do it, that we call it a curtain wall system. So we'll do the wall, visual wall, and also the spandrel wall. What do we mean by the spandrel wall? Um, I think students may not be know about that. Only things that when you come to work, uh, if you expose to the chance to deal with your own design as the, for the facade, you know, then you know what is all this about. If you give this part to other people, so-called faster specialists, then you will never know. So the, the spandrel glass is a very simple solution how to do that. You can see that it's still the whole uh, full height of the glass. Vision glass is still, when I st stand inside the building, when I look it up, I still can be visual the external view. Spandrel glass from outside, you can see it's a bit like bluish or, you know, but that is because we put a piece of things there with whatever colors you like so that you from outside when you look at the design you want it to be contrast, you want it to be harmonized, it depends on you. So the glass that cannot be see-through in the so-called curtain walling system, you call it a spandrel, a spandrel glass, that's how it is. So uh, by doing that, you can pick up some glass but not the normal glass because the normal glass really give a very poor performance to the entire of the building. It attracts the heat immediately into your so-called habitable area. It's just like a car. Uh, if you buy a car without uh, doing a tin tinted films or whatever, you will definitely feel the heat gain into your car very fast, especially if you park your car under the sun, no trees, 12 to 1 o'clock in uh, like reason the, the, the climates now. And I bet you, you will, well, the moment the heat gains into your, your space, it's very difficult to get it out. You need to open all the four walls on your switch on your air cons into the maximum to get the heat out, you know. But that's car, you know, but what happened to the building? So if you choose to design a building for that, sometimes it's the preference of a client brief or whatever, you have no choice, then you have to start to use a special treated glass. So in a common industry that we practice, we call it low E glass or double glazing glass. All these uh, special treated glass that come with the, uh, of course, with the cost, it depends. So that's why we, we have to be very uh, smart in a way or creative in a way that how you arrange your glass in different way, it still can be played around. It doesn't mean that when you use this one, it has to be all the same, you know. So, but that one will come into the practice really. So if I, my talks uh, is good, then you can, we can have uh, more interaction with all the students later on. I think uh, a lot of things to be shared around. So the exposed balcony, slab projections, mass concrete wall, and then you can put in some in, uh, insulation into your interior. These are all the uh, 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 treatments to the so-called building facade envelopes. You put out all these things, it helps to reduce the kind of a uh, direct uh, heat sun into your building. So these are the basic solutions that people are playing around once a day. They like me. Like I say we have a sun which is a, to, or a totally is a free free resources is all around here. I mean it's compared with other countries like American they have to wait until summer. So they have only they can really enjoy the sun. For here we have sun all the time but we have to also find a way to appreciate what we have. So the opening of the, 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 the north wall and the south wall, uh, you can do that because we know that north-south is don't get a direct sunlight with that. So you can, in your design, you can do the kind of opening play around with your with the design. And then like I said previously just now, narrow your plane, plan to maximize the daylighting so that you don't have to spend uh, extra uh, planning for how you want to put your lighting, the artificial lighting. Yeah. The moment you, uh, you, you plan your layouts very well, 
that in the daytime, daytime you almost can save almost all the, uh, or maybe I would say completely, you know, it depends on how your design, you definitely will not use a single of the switch to just switch on few lightings around. You know, that is a saving for, 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 for in terms of electricity, you know, especially in houses, whatever. I'm sure that when, uh, I think the, this pandemic of the MCO is a very good experience for every one of us, especially we are taking uh, this course as architecture, whether you're practicing architecture or your students, everybody felt the same. I think around the world, everybody, you know, then they'll start to say, oh, this, this is my house, you know, so when, uh, I, I've been designed so many things for other people, but now my house, whether Am I enjoying or whether am I suffering, you know? So now it's a time for you to really think, you know, you, you do a lot of things, but you, somehow it tends to forget too many things also. So it's a very, to me, this pandemic or this uh, MCO is a very good time for you to really calm down yourself and think of and observe around. So if you are staying in a high rise condominium, you have very limited spaces, then what happened? So if you are landed houses, then you might face another problem also. If I mean, I'm talking about your own habitats. Uh, that is a question that I give all to the students to think about that. So besides then opening, doing the open on a north-south wall itself, you also can consider doing some light shelf on top of your roof indirectly. There are many equipments that can do it uh, with a very cheap price. Then you can harvest the, the lights, you know. Then the window areas at least, uh, you know, then we have to do it. The window area should be at least one tenth, means the ratio is about one tenth of the overall of the floor area. So you don't create too many of the window areas, especially facing the east and the west. So we have to reduce it and then place it smartly. The depth of the room should not be also exceeded 2.5 times of the window height of the light. So these are the basic uh, guidelines for everyone. And then like the solar protection, I call it a solar protection or people can call it a sun shading or whatever. There are many, many of the way you can do it creatively doesn't make your, you can see there's pictures showing around there. The way how you place everything, it will help your entire building looks amazing, you know. But like for instance, like the round domes here, behind is actually all the flats, very flats, you know, but they just create some domes with some beautiful louvers all around, right? They give you a different types of the uh, feels really. And when you create this one, it's not just aesthetically because it, it gives you the shadings itself. When the sun puffs and turns all around, right, that will give you a different shading. So you also will encourage people coming out to the so-called the placemaking area to enjoy the, the, the space outside the building. Right now, you can see there are many buildings outside there. Once you design it, when especially in this hot climate, right, you will not come out at all. It's so hot. So you, how to create a place making, people are now started, uh, other, um, I think developing countries have started to look into that. Here, if you realize that in the BKL or KL areas or even in Islamo area, they also started to emphasize on that. In Penang also, they're picking up these things quite fast. They started to create many public spaces, they call it place making, that people can use it anytime. Anytime, any day, you know, I feel comfortable, I mingle around. That's the interactions uh, to break through the so-called social uh, differences. So you have vertical sunshade, you can do the vegetation as well, the green wall. That's another way to minimize your heat gain into your building. And then the natural ventilation. Natural ventilations, uh, one of the things is that you have to make sure the cross ventilation is important. If there's no cross ventilation or only by one way, one way single cross and you don't get that kind of maximum of the effect. So to make use of the roof as part of your ventilation opening is very uh, important. For other country, we can do chimneys, you know, but in here, because we have a lot of pitch roof, a lot, you see, um, I found that in our architects, we like to do a lot of flat roof. Why? Why flat roof? I find it's a common area common things that people will do that when you resolve certain things come to certain areas that oh shit how i'm going to do this roof already how i'm going to pitch my roof or how i'm going to put these things here once you have no solution that's it flat that's the that is the trick that i think uh, everybody has been playing since very many years until now is this the same but by doing a flat roof doesn't mean that you stop the uh, to make it as a ventilated roof ventilated roof means you have a very good insulation for the roof at the same time, you allow the air to actually ventilate, get in and get out so that it don't get into your buildings. So you can see that um, uh, from this screen itself. 
that's how that you still have your uh, you can create or nice living areas in the attic or you don't you do not want an attic is fine but you has to be insulated and then the winds come in then it can go out by the you know the, the design of the roof that's called a breathable roof or ventilated roof it depends on what sort of terms that you're using so for flat roof the same thing you can create uh, by putting some louvers you know that something like a chimney effect but you can create a lowest round, then that's how the, the air from the entire building come in, then there's a space to go out. It's like, a, that's one of the ideas that's of sharing. Then for the cooling system, um, as I said, you have all this uh, wind cross everything, but at the same time, how you also can cool up the entire building by, that's why, uh, create a bo water body or you put your water features, it helps to uh, evaporate some cooling, uh, make the space look like a cool and uh, especially in the hot areas, you know. And at the same time, uh, air conditioning is helping if you're using uh, so-called the uh, commercial building. But in choosing the air conditioning systems, it has to, there's a lot of uh, system to be going to choose. So you have to uh, basically to discuss with your engineers to choose a better air conditioning system that which is more sustainable uh, means they uh, they use lessers of the energy, but they give you a maximum of the performance to the building itself. So that uh, these are the cost saving everything, and practically, uh, many years back, maybe maybe the cost is a bit high, but now because it's become very common already, so the price are actually uh, quite reasonable. And at, at the same time, actually, these items that you use it for green uh, elements itself, the government is still giving the intensity. So it's still encouragement for people like our clients, so-called developers, who keep on doing that, you know. So besides than that, planting, uh, plant, you plant around all the trees and the, 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 the plantings, it's is, is the scales of doing that. But uh, be careful of when you're putting out the water features. Uh, um, it's a lot of people that thought that may, when I create a water feature, it definitely give you a cooling effect. Uh, no, you have to really look at the entire of the original of how the entire bigger size, I'm not talking about your building lot size, you have to look into the macro, of the entire uh, bigger township area that in that township do they have a uh, so-called river or water features whatever if there are none you want to create you really have to like i said in the beginning in the first slide that you have to do all the data collection you have to understand how the climate the wind everything because if you simply create something it doesn't turn out as what you want then you will end up to solve more problems later that's how uh, many areas started to form the kind of so-called heat island uh, uh, effects really and that will bring up to another uh, bigger problem that's what we call it a global climate change so be careful of what you are putting and what you decide want to plan into your your design or your township you know everything must come with a reason whatever you design it always come with a purpose and a reason and you must do a complete study of that Heating uh, is more suitable for the uh, a site which is located at the higher le uh, areas such as Highland, uh, like uh, Gunting Highlands, Cameron's Highlands, you know, these other areas. Because they have a big difference of the, 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 in terms of the climate. You know. So for these buildings at this Highland area, when, they, when we do the design for them, we have to do a bit different. We want to attract the heat in into the building because when it's cold it's really cold so they need the heat to warm up when the sun uh, uh, whether the sun heats come into the building the building itself is already warming, warming up so the humans uh, occupants in this building they also feel warm by the same time that's how it plays with it so this is a different design for the building in the highlands area so it's completely different from what we are having here around uh, in our cities or in any of the uh, lower areas. So another thing is the building envelopes and the materials. So there are many materials that you can choose because um, when we do a design, now things are become uh, more and more and more tech because of the technologies and science. So that we, when you choose all the building material, we have to be very careful uh, by not just looking at uh, a surface data or by just one catalog, you really have to do a lot of uh, studies about that, looking through, checking through whether what they claim, uh, whether it's certified, really go to the proper R&D, you know. So uh, as I said before, we had to uh, encourage to cut down the carbon footprint. So we always encourage people to 
outsource the building material within the local area. So the guideline uh, in GBI, they always say within the 500 kilometer radius. It's basically is around the whole Malaysia area. But of course, it's certain material that you cannot really cannot find it. There's no choice. Then that's another uh, reason. But try to get as much as you can all within the local contact because that will definitely cut down a lot of this unnecessary carbon footprint. Uh, imagine that you're getting the material from overseas, you have to get, get through either by the shippings or by the freight. If these are the, consists a lot of more of the carbon footprints, you know. So then of course we also always uh, encourage people to also consider to use a recycle and also reusable uh, reusable material for with a low toxic emission or the words that you might heard before is called low VOC. So you can sort it out later what's more low VOC. Low VOC sometimes it doesn't mean that you smell it then it's toxic. You know? Sometimes it can be smellless and also colorless. So that is the danger of that. Um, I give you one example. This is this one you can smell. Uh, you buy a new car. A lot of people like new car, right? You open out oh the plastic everything. I would also do not want to open out everything. And the new car smell really new. I tell you those are the those are not the low uh, VOC is a very high VOC, very, very toxic. So be careful of that because the, those things can cause cancers. Uh, it happens before in many countries. I've been met up with some specialist groups that uh, specialize in do all the survey for all the houses doing renovation. And they found that because people don't aware about these uh, VOC things, a low VOC things, and a lot of these uh, materials that use is really it smells like uh, it's no smell and no colors so it's like the invisible uh, toxic then a lot of people got it and and uh, there are many cancer patients have a long time so they go and find it out and they found out actually these are the materials that cause it so they found it this is uh, important to educate people around as well so when you want to renovate your house whatever it is choose please choose a, a materials that is really safe for that so another way to help to uh, to minimize the heat gain into your building at the same time can make your whole facade look nicer. You can consider, like I said, the lighter color material or you can do uh, green verticals uh, uh, as a facade. The way of doing that, um, in the beginning, maybe maybe a lot of people thought that it's a very uh, high maintenance. It's, it is not actually. Uh, I think now the landscape architects are getting uh, much more skillful. They know that which type of plants to, to play around with and which type of plants and the hierarchy. The higher maybe require more sun, less water. The bottom part maybe the uh, less sun but more water, you know. So that's how they play around with different types of the uh, planting. That's how they give you different textures of that. Uh, I think now people are getting very experienced with that compared with two years back. And other things to help you is also you can use part of the solar system to be part of a facade uh, to harvest the lighting free and then to generate as electrical city to use for this building. So these are one of the ways to do the energy saving for the building. Besides than that, uh, I just touched on the solar panel. Is it uh, you? We can also use uh, consider you use it for the solar water heater. That's why very common. You can find it in uh, residential area. And then wind energy. I think wind energy not so popular in Malaysia because our wind load is not that great. Uh, compared with other countries, yes, they can use the wind to uh, become uh, and uh, to to transform into energy to use it. So uh, other ways is actually the biogas uh, is part of the uh, way that you can use it to not just generate electricity to your building. Um, recently, I found out that it's quite interesting also that you can generate this uh, so-called electric system to become part of your cooking kitchen things and also that you don't have to spend extra electricity for the, building, uh, for the kitchen itself. You know? um, this is also part of the uh, interaction idea exchange that I get it into so that I'm sharing there's many, many creative ways of doing that. You know. And then water, you have to choose your water appliances very uh, carefully. Um, people start to uh, go for the rating. You can see that the five star rating, it's the same for the electrical appliances that you can choose a five star. That is considered that as energy saving and this is a water saving. In terms of the water, they control the amount of water to, uh, to, to, to produce for you during your usage. At the same time, we also encourage people to do the rainwater harvesting. The most commonly people harvest the rainwater is for irrigation. Irrigation means for watering your plant uh, around your, your houses or your commercial areas or any of the design development. 
uh, one tree may not say you need a lot of water, but if you have a lot, then you will spend a lot of water to watering these plants, you know. So we are trying to reduce the wastage of water by using a direct portable water into the into this irrigation. So what we do is, because we have a lot of rain in Malaysia as well, so we harvest the rain and then use it for irrigation. Um, you can also consider using to wash your car porch and all these things, you know. So these are the things that you can use and save money in a sense. Recyclable, what do you call it, grey water. Grey water is like um, the water that you use uh, for your no, after your dishwashing, um, it's not the dark water. Dark water is completely like your toilet come out. The water comes back uh, from your toilet bowl. Grey water is the water that you just uh, just for washing your hands, you know, then your dishes or maybe your cups and all these things. But you just want to check it out away. It's also in uh, waste in a sense. So you can use it basically also for, for irrigations and other, other purposes. So these are the way that how you save your water bills. Uh, uh, even though Malaysia waters, uh, I know the water bills are very low, very cheap, but compared with other countries, I can guarantee you their water, I think a one bottle of just a plain water is more expensive than any of the water you can imagine, just compared with, uh, say, uh, soft drink pokes and all these things. So we, we, we really have to treasure what we have around here. These are the free resources, so we get it easily, but we have to appreciate it. We, we don't simply just waste the resources. You know. uh, by knowing that now the, the whole thing has been changed, the global climate change, everything. So we have to prepare for that. We can't make the whole earth become more burdens for that really. Drainage system is not about just your normal drainage. You can do it very uh, creative in the sense that we can do it like you can see from the screen from uh, my right side. Uh, it's a drainage system, but we call it a bioswing means we can make it like a planting area. From surface, it looks very nice. Aesthetically, it's nice. You can put some pebble stones, some plants, and all these things. It's called bioswing. But underneath, it's actually all the surface drain means from the exposed surface drain to the, uh, they were all collected into the drain. And it played a very important part also that all these papers and the plant itself is like a natural filtration. You don't have to spend extra money to buy from a manufacturer to do the filter, but this is a natural filtration. So you filter out all the clean water and then you certain people will harvest it for other usage, but this clean water will go in and and and, and it will uh, at least it won't it will trap all the uh, what do you call it, the trash, the dust and everything that will helps to avoid and prevent the flood, flash flush if it happens in so what is happening around here is because too many uh, developments has been happening around, happens around, and um, these uh, treatments is not aware by many people. So that is the problem that the flash flush is uh, happen everywhere. Just by uh, rain, heavy rain by half an hour or maybe twenty minutes, then you can get all the flash flush every day, everywhere really. So that's very serious. It's getting more serious and more serious each time. You know. So I think this is very bad. Um, as a future generation coming out, we really have to consider all this or for the existing practicing architect, I think please consider that. It's not that hard to do it. Uh, it's a very simple solution. It's all by nature. So I, I realized that we are humans are spending too much time for years to inventing something, but you already have a natural resources just right next to you. You just need to know how to use it wisely to solve all the problems that part of created by the humans, you know. And then if you have a, a say, a parking areas or pebble stones or the pavement that you see, you can do it like uh, you can see from the bottom of the screen that you don't have to really make it very solid, like a concrete everything. We make, we call it like, a, uh, we, 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 we name it like a more like a, a, pro, a porous. The word is a porosity. So we make it more uh, gaps so that you can see some plants flying around here. So that means that you're giving a space for the surface or the rainwater to come down to when you touch the surface, it will still have the chance to let the water go back to the nature. So that is many ways of doing the treatment. Sanitization, as I said, that, um, that touch about the black water. So black water, I think now uh, it started to in previous all the development project, people are trying to avoid uh, using the black water because the thing simply is the treatment system is too complicated and then nobody will really believe that after you 
use black water turn into something, will you really have the confidence to use it? By psychology, you know that the black water is come from your toilet bowls, you know, that kind of things. But um, if you do not want to change it into something like drinkable waters, like what Singapore's that happened, or uh, even Malaysia, we also have, you know, uh, in Langkawi, there's one uh, very famous uh, uh, hotel resort. It's called Frangipani. And uh, the, it, the, the test is done maybe, and it confirmed 100% it's become safe drinks water. By using all the nature resources, plants, stones, everything, different layers, and the filter, 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 everything, at the end, they become a really completely guaranteed 100% certified drinkable water. It, it, it works, you know, but it's still not very popular around here. Um, so what people will do that is they convert into a biogas and compose it and, do, and, and change it into a reused water for, again, for irrigation or for other purposes, you know. So not so popular become a drinkable water because we are still able to get some water to drink uh, in, in, in a kind of fairly uh, price, you know. So another uh, guideline is actually that we have to encourage people to do the uh, waste management uh, segregation. Uh, it's still not very popular, but at least it's getting better and better that I can start to see that people start to segregate their waste. But of course, people will say that the moment when you segregate your waste, then the the alarm flora comes around, they'll just throw everything in, uh, into the, the, the garbage car. Well, true and not true, because I see that, uh, at least in my areas, that they don't do that. They they know that you're properly segregated, that the waste that is going, supposed to go into the garbage track, then you put your waste in the, in the what you call that, the, uh, the, the bin. Those need to be segregated in the paper, in the aluminum, in plastic, everything. You segregate in different bags and you put it at uh, the unlocated area. They will not touch that and they will wait for another recycle truck to come. I think this is a good change. Happens around. Uh, actually, in Malaysia, we have a lot of good policies. Make, uh, I think, faster and advanced than many other countries. I remember um, in four or five years, I went to Hong Kong and I started to talk to these people. They are the specialists in all the uh, waste management and they are very proudly and tell me that, oh, we already had this. I said, oh, I said this year, then our government, uh, in this September, they're going to launch it. You know, they was like shocked in the sense that, you know, oh, you are, you guys are fast, you know. So that's why I say that doing green and sustainable in things, right, we are not very far from many people. Uh, we are quite par in the sense that with Singapore and Hong Kong and Hong Kong is trying to catch it up uh, what we are doing, I think, uh, but they are also, they have their, their own good policy that we can refer to. So, but they are very alert in all this thing. When time, uh, wherever, when I share something, uh, some ideas with, uh, in a meeting in the Asia regions or international, they're quickly going to come, uh, can you share this, can you share that with me? You know? So they are very alert in this. So I'm here, um, I found that the lacking of the interest in that uh, in, in these few things are still lacking among the architects. Uh, so I think we have to start to really pick it up very fast because you have a very good policy, you have all the things, things are developed very fast, but why, why are not we looking into this and use it very wisely? You know? So I think we shouldn't let it go. And segregation, so the waste is another knowledge that you thought that this whole plastic you can actually chuck into the plastic, no. Your, your, what you call that, the extra information for you, your, 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 your soft drinks, plastic bottles, the bottle itself, the wrapping paper is different types of the plastic, the, the caps is different uh, types of plastic, and the bottle itself is another type of plastic. So if you really want to do segregation, the bottle caps have to be one side, the plastic wraps around have to be another side, and then this one have to be uh, thrown uh, or, and, and, and recycled in these areas, you know. There's many knowledge about that. So, uh, it really need to be educated and, and let people know how to do a proper segregation of your solid waste. Landscaping is not that simply plant any landscape that you like. Uh, then you plant, then you think, oh, I have a very green side already. Uh, in, instead of aesthetic, whether it's, uh, it's beautiful enough is another question. But I think to simply planting it, it will not help you in the sense that uh, you can help to reduce the heat island effect. So we have to plant very smartly. We have to make sure all our plants require minimum watering. And then the hardscape areas that we're using the material, as I said earlier, that it has to be uh, as porous as possible or another way, call it a permeability. Uh, uh, That's the word. To allow the water to get through, like you can see from the, 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 the sketch show in my most right-hand side of the screens. 
that the water can go back to the mother earth and then you know it's the cycle is go back in the same way so we don't simply use any material planting any tree that you think it will help but it doesn't not so every part of this have come with knowledge you know so but doing this smartly basic uh, i think it helps you in terms of your design and you can talk to your special uh, uh, landscape architects so to, to plan around what you want. If you don't tell the landscape architect, they don't know because you are the architect, you come out, the, you get a whole empty piece of land. You definitely know what you want for your whole concept for your development, not just for your building. Your building has one concept, but you do not want something outside doing is not gel with your building, right? So that is one of the things that you have to be alert and, and, and discuss and let people work it out to achieve the, what you call it, your concept for that. So next will be more into cover into bigger uh, scales. Uh, it's more like a township really, but it's also part of our our knowledge we have to do. We have to know. It's, this is not solely be, uh, belongs to the planners, as I say. Uh, sometimes architect also can pick up the planning, so you can you can become architect planners. You can involve in this. Uh, that's the things that why architects needs to know a lot. Thing we don't people don't simply call you as a lead architect because you are the lead. Or, be, or simply because you study more years than compared with other other professions. No, it always come with a reason. So you have to know from macro to micro to every single thing. That is our specialties. This is our value. So you cannot let it go and let other people go and find uh, go and learn by themselves. It's part of you, you know. So these are the continue of the guidelines again. We have to make sure the whole township. What is going on around that? We have to play around, not just with the uh, so-called the effective appliances, the, the energy, everything, but it's uh, again come back to the occupants. We have to encourage people to have the uh, behavior change. And then uh, when you have a building itself, it's quite common outside uh, practices that the owners of the building, their priority is not going to the uh, occupants. But now we are encouraging that in order to help you to save energy, we're not looking in one building, one development, but we're talking about a whole township. A township can become a big city, a city become a metropolitan, uh, then it can grow up to a country and country to then become a whole world. So imagine all this has using a lot of energies, then that's how also part of the problems that it become a whole world. Thing. So if people start to change their behavior, changing the mentality of thinking so way before and now it helps everybody play their part as individual and one plus one is become two two plus one become it's got become more and more that's how uh, 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 uh work together as a team to make the world become more sustainable make our world so architecture actually playing a very important role of helping this because each of the country when they talk about development economies they always tie up with development there's no way to run away. So your your role as it is very important. So we also play a part to advise the clients that they will hand over this building for their maintenance people. So we had to educate in the same that your demand of the management principle had to give top priority to the building occupants. What do you mean that means the comfort of the building's occupant, whether the light is come uh, is sufficient to, uh, into the space they are using, whether it's too cold, the aircon that you provided is it within the comfort area and the bill electricity everything so all the equipment that you spend it, it really tie back with energy so if you're able to do that to give the priority to the uh, building occupants it helps in the sense of you choose carefully in the design state and come to construction stage everything is in the efficient and uh, uh, energy saving it plays a role so things have to be think ahead the best is during the design stage. You think of everything. Then when come to the uh, during construction to the completion to the maintenance next time, you don't have to uh, worry too much about. You have to spend extra money to to make good of certain things or up improving certain things. You know. So these are all unnecessary. At the end, you call back the calculator and call back the cost is more than you know more than what you thought. You know. So you that's why the best always is during the design stage. So another thing is that we have to, have to talk about that you have to make well balance to the public spaces. What do we mean by public spaces? We have always have to allow, beside that all the building at least, uh, as I said, the placemaking area, allow 50% spaces for street, road, public 
gardens and park. So I've already give you the device uh, the, uh, uh, from the 50, you can divide into 30% for the street, 50% for the open space. So you create these spaces for people to interact, you know. Um, the, 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 the upcoming, all the guidelines are all, all very uh, close to each other. They are all tiding back to each of these uh, so-called township areas already, or one huge development. Just now we are focusing in one single individual uh, buildings or any types of building, but right now I'm talking about more in bigger scales already. So sometimes you met a developer, they give you a piece of land like this apart. They have big water features and everything, and they have all the uh, all the residents, whether it's landed properties or the high rises, it's all planned in the same. So we have to start to help to look into all this. Some, because sometimes doing planners, they also they have different types of thinking of how to do the the, the, the planning side. But to have a bigger piece of land to plan this is always the involvement of architects. We've been done it so many already. Because it somehow is owned by a developer. We are not doing the jobs like a government that I go to one big area and then the government had to start to do the plan, the whole township master plan, they call it. But for some for developers, you also have a bigger lens like the Desa Parks. I've just called an example. Then then you have as an architect, you start to help to plot plan the, the, the so-called planning, how the road is doing that. It's, it's, it's another scale of that already. It's a bit different from what you're doing building, but the same mentalities and all the guidelines that you're using until until the guidelines on 21, it really helps us see how you actually portion it all your items around. So that this part is actually for what that, that portion is also for more commercial and then this one for residents, then I'm going to build up more things and let people interact. So these are the 50% that you have to allocate 30 for the street, 15 for the open space. Then we have to encourage the mix use, mix, mix of the land use. It's become a very popular thing that happen in uh, Paris really. They start to do this kind of mix use. Uh, they no longer uh, concentrate one area all uh, commercial, then the other area is solely residence, then the other one become uh, industrial. So what you're trying to encourage people to do that uh, mix land use, that you have the commercial together with the uh, residents and other things, you are combining the economies, administrative and also the residential activities together. That will help to reduce your travel uh, needs, you know, so you don't have to actually drive out your car, you know, just to walk from one area, just to go out to another area. That's, I can see that in many developer countries, in, especially in Europe countries, they are already doing that. So that's why the peoples around the country, they walks a lot they they, they they really reduces using a lot of car they started to changing one place to another place to become a mixed land use so i think in here malaysia we can do that uh there's one that the uh, uh, among the consultants uh, uh everybody is, well, was uh, discussing about the that the authorities give a very high density of block ratios you know do we really need that whether it's suitable or not the a lot of people say no it's not suitable my view is differently why uh, in Hong Kong, you can do that because the land use has been almost to the max ready. And their facilities, everything are perfect, you know. You can get, because they have all this kind of mixed use together, they can get anything just by that. And their public transportation is perfect. And people are using 80% public transport, 20% of the, their own individual car. Here is different. 80% on car, 20% on public uh, transportation. So it means that our connection, our readiness for that is not yet. So we do not need to reach to the level that every development must go as high as possible. I've talked to a few very famous architects I think from overseas, but they have been staying in Malaysia for many years. They say, well, another few hundred uh, stories. Uh, it's like everybody is competing, building higher and higher, taller and taller building. But whether is this sustainable in a sense? I would think it's not. Malaysia, we still have a lot of lands. It depends on why you have to grow up, but no grow to spread it out widely and use it very wisely. So I think the mind concept is a bit different. I think we have to start to change our mind of thinking and our behavior also. We can be very, uh, uh, you will think that other architects in other countries, they are doing fantastic job, fantastic design, but before you just so-called copy the things into your, apply the same thing into your own country piece of land, you have to, as I said, again, go back to the same thing. You have to look at your local context, your topography, your climates, everything. Do you really need that? And then the surrounding, your, your, your surroundings, whether the 
the surrounding itself, the township itself already have his own history, his own culture is already there. So why are you putting something, I call it an odd things and aliens into this area? It doesn't blend at all. And slowly this area, this township will lose its own identity. I think it's very sad thing to know. I see in, uh, I think in Malaysia, all the states, some of the states, they have their own identity, but because of modern developments, whatever, people demolish, build something, and when I go back and see, and I feel very sad for that. It's a bit different from Kuala Lumpur here. Kuala Lumpur city is uh, very different. This is a bit uh, extra uh, information for all the students so that you have to remember today, <laughs> my sharing, you have to remember for the rest of life. Kuala Lumpur in the history is an area for workers from overseas to come and dig out and find all the minerals and everything. So basically the whole thing is for people to work in the, in the, in the mounds and all these things. There is no special building around at that time, many, 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 many years back. So basically, you are asking that what has been this uh, so-called, this uh, one, any special building left for us as identity, none. So that's why, why our previous government spent money and built up the Twin Towers, many identical uh, landmark and make, uh, make uh, uh, become an identity of Kuala Lumpur. That is a reason for that. But that doesn't apply to other other states, you know. For instance, Penang is very heritage. Uh, Taiping is also very heritage and they have beautiful ecologies and all this thing. So you do not need to actually put in all this high-rise building here. It become very odd. I've seen the same thing happen in India also, I think just uh, last year. It was shocked to me that um, it, uh, the place I went is uh, quite, I think, 300 kilometers away from the, the desert. But uh, in this city, it's full of all the beautiful heritage, uh, fantastic design. And the architects around there are very, very, very proud of that. But suddenly, when I just landed and I, on the way to the water, and I saw something like, <gasps> well, I see this build, modern building. You can pick this modern building and can you simply, you can put in Kuala Lumpur, put in, put in uh, maybe in other country here and there. It, it gel with any of the, this so-called, I call it a typical city identities really. It's no different. It's like you and me, different country, we are competing the design, but our design are almost the same because there's no identity for that. You know, that is a very sad thing. So after tonight, you give a thoughts that are we going to create something that is not really suitable for our own ecology, our own climate, our own local context, everything. You have something that you can really use it and do it well, and you still can be very shine like a different celebrity architects one day, you know. Um, that when by doing that, you can reduce the needs of travel again. And that's why I said just now, we had to do the social mixture. Uh, now you still see that a lot of places are doing that. The poor will stay in one side, the rich will stay in one side, the medium will another side. And everybody staying in different zone will be having this kind of so-called invisible or visible barriers. They just want to tell you that the separation is this. But good, no, uh, I think it's not good in the sense. Uh, I think in Paris already had that problem and now they're actually changing their way of doing this. So they are going into this kind of so-called mixed social structure. The mixed social structure and also the social integration is different. Social structure is more to deal with the policies and the cultures, whatever, already happened in that area, maybe before you born, it's already there. But for, uh, social interaction is more to the humans. Eyes to eyes, face to face, these kind of things. You know, I'm from this class of people and from that class of people. So we always do the segregation. That is why we having a problem of slums and also the problems of the social problems. So when you try to segregate these things away, slow, soon or later, they will become a problem. When they become a problem area, it will create problems direct and indirectly to the medium and so-called the upper class of people. So we do not want this kind of thing. So good sense is that, that uh, I think local Malaysia governments have already seen that. So they are trying to improve the existing uh, low cost area or even uh, trying to remove all the slums, illegal slums area and they put them into a more comfort area but with basic but comfort areas. So we then, then uh, a lot of policy has been making into our, our, our development assumption when you come to work as a practicing architect. When you want to develop a land, especially residential, then in the policy saying that it's a part of the requirement that the 
high ends and the median end and the low end of the uh, of this uh, all this the residential has to be a uh, uh, reach a balance of the mixtures of certain percentage. You cannot segregate them from the same piece of land. In another way, is I'm having a land as a developer. If I want to do something very high end condominium, I want to sell how many millions, whatever it is. But at the same piece of site, you must also allocate for a certain percentage for the low cost of people. So a lot of people, a lot of developer, they are still cannot. Uh, they they are feel hard to accept at the beginning because they say if I sell very high price to these very rich people, then I mean if you are the rich people, you buy this, you definitely do not want to see that. Oh, when I open a window, then oh my god, I'm seeing you know uh, another not so high end design, and then the people, you know, that kind of uh, um. I would say the humans, uh, human factors more than anything, you know. So these are the things that we are trying to avoid. Once you solve this, everything will be go into more sustainable. We, when you talk about sustainable greener, it's not just the building itself. We want the occupants, we want the social to also reach that level. That's how you call it overall coverage of a sustainable, more than a green. That's what I'm trying to say. So the mixture that we always encourage is like 20 to 50%. The resident spaces have to be allocated for some affordable houses. And we blend them in. And try blending in is also giving a way to educate these people. So they have become uh, more, uh, maybe they become more uh, behaved. And they will start to look at, well, the people with that, with highly educated, then they are there. So you will maybe trigger them in the sense that I also want to study hard, I also improve myself. So that in, in indirect or directly, actually you are helping them, educate them into the level that everybody reach a very peaceful, uh, peaceful uh, level. So that's uh, beginning that, you can see the clear segregations. So the right side is showing that how you create a place making a common area uh, to let different classes of people to use it. And then uh, if you have roads, whatever, you can create a lot of this kind of uh, uh, elevated uh, a pedestrian walkway to link people from one building to another building. I've seen it in other countries, but in Malaysia, I think we, uh, we really can move into that. I think this is a really fantastic idea. Um, by having all these kind of so-called public spaces, encourage people to have more interactions, you know, so that indirectly, people are sharing the same thing, you know, and maybe at the beginning it's very really difficult that they will still throw the trash or whatever it is, but you have to start from something. Somebody had to do it, and slowly you affect the people. It's, it's, it's always in such a sense that humans, many are followers, you know, when they see it, then okay, okay, then I'll, slowly I'll do that. So you change. So another way is also when you come to a design, uh, the high density of the neighborhood land always, always give uh, enough of the trigger for the economy. So when you modify from a single block to a block times two and then by three, whatever of the density itself, how you encourage the economy, like I said, you already cut short the travel distance, people just walk and deliverable, everything is there. So it's really become a self-sustained area, plot by plot, plot by lot. So that is how you reach the kind of, uh, uh, indirectly you're helping the economies move on by doing uh, planning well your design. So again, this is uh, it's all uh, related to what I'm trying to say. In, when you talk about townships, all these are come, it's all different terms, different in the sense of the certain, certain definition, but it looks alike. But when you put all these things together, it will work perfectly. Connectivity is, when you design a street pattern, it's also very important. If your street patterns and the network between one area to another area is doesn't gel with, and you create a problem, it doesn't, it won't help you to reach what you want. But if you create your street patterns, the networking, you plan it very well. When I'm from one area to another area, you can see that for a walkable area, then I, I, I slowly I can get what I want in a very uh, convenient distance, you know. So then from there. We are trying to forget about the car. We might think maybe by using the cycling or maybe some uh, any any of the mobiles that is uh, in a hybrid sense. You know, maybe uh, you know, you just by reach that. So slowly we are moving into that. Create a lot more this bazaar and place making, trying to reduce this of car usage because car is definitely create a lot of this uh, car unnecessary carbon footprint and it really make a disaster and pollution to the whole entire environment. I was simply amazed by our one month only uh, one month of the MCO and because I'm from Laka, 
I know how Malacca's River looks like during I was young and then when I was uh, in my high school and then come back from the university and then now the MCO, I see uh, the fastest transition by the nature is that I was so shocked. The river itself is black so black, so dark, and with a lot of this kind of monitor lizards all around on the both sides of the riverbank. Then of course government spend money to uh, clean out the whole river. It, it is the river actually connect to the Malacca Street uh, Sea. So they clean it out, but it, the, the water is no longer become black. Uh, of course it become lighter, it becomes something like a milky color, but uh, then people start to have some river crews, a lot of commercials go around. And but the water smell, it smell. But what is amazing and amazed me completely is during the MCO when nobody is allowed to go out and no car, no everything, no ship, no 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 cruise. One month times, the river itself become clear. I was like, it never happens, you know. You can see the fish by itself. This is simply amazing. So believe in our mother earth can cure by itself, but we don't burden them because we burden it. There's no way to cure. So walk. Around, walk around, it's also help your body healthier and all those, at the same time you cut down all these uh, unnecessary uh, fuels and carbon footprints. So urban farms are matter, it does. As I said, when you create all the farm itself and more of the uh, mixture use, the street life and make it more workable, so the design compact of the block buildings then it make the whole entire area become a very livable area. People will just walk and they don't feel tired, you know, because and when I walk through, I can see these different things and then I have different types of design or place making. This is simply amazing. It's just like people say, why ladies go to shopping, you never get tired, you can walk four whole days. If the shopping mall is 10 floor, very huge, you are never tired. They're almost the same concept because all these things attract people, attract your, uh, it divert your attention into like, instead of looking at one long road from here to there, empty, nothing, you will say, oh, I'd rather to use a car or motorcycle or whatever it is. That requires a few. But you create something very interesting by uh, playing around with the future farms and then all the streets and all the activities around, I think is perfect, you know, it helps. Walkability, like I said, you plan two kilometers from the house, you'll get the food, three kilometers, you'll get to the sports centers, five kilometers, you can go to your working places or worship area. These are the things that people doesn't mind. But of course, with the facts that I'm saying that, you have all these interesting different things going around, then people will don't mind to actually to do the walking. Of course, with some very nice uh, shading of the street uh, from the trees and all these things, the coverage of that from the sun, then I think it, our country actually can be make it very interesting to walk with, you know, not necessarily have to be in a cold country to walk. So another one, I think uh, it's not happened here. I saw it in other country. Uh, it's very good. Uh, we have a clearly defined pedestrian walkway and also the cycling area. But one thing we do not have is actually the cycling extent to reach to the public transport. Um, in overseas, it becomes so common. People uh, cycle a lot because they have really have a special comfort lane just for cycling. So the people don't walk at the cycling area. People will walk at the pedestrian pedestrian walkway and the car has its own road and you know so each are clearly defined. So it becomes that people cycle a lot. They'll carry their bikes everywhere. So sometimes they cycle, 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 but they want to reach to their to their working place. They need certain public uh, public transportation such as buses or you call it the LRT, MLTs, you know, this kind. So they, are, they, are, they have a special coach designated for this for you to bring into your, your, your bicycle. So I think we can do that here, you know. Uh, it, it's just a method of that. You bring in the idea, you educate people, then how it works, you know. So there's another way to encourage people to do more walk walking, more cycling, rather than spend so much on the uh, cars and also uh, other mobiles. And then we also have to promote the shift encourage model or shift what do you mean by encourage model shift like say from flying to this so the hierarchy like a pyramid we want to reach that kind of a walking and running uh you know the kind of uh, the, the, the the situations cycling is another one but definitely not the not the bottom parts that you have your own car your own car sharing taxi all this and slowly it will be become um will be space of one soon so now you can see that in the mall started to have a lot of this kind of vehicle efficiency that you get a hybrid car, then you get electrical charger, 
But what I'm trying to say is that I realized that it's only happened around the city, like Chaos, Langok, Fang Valley, or maybe in uh, Penang Town or whatever. But if you go up slightly from other state, let's say Balai Kampong or whatever, I don't think you can get this kind of electrical charges, you know. So uh, these are the things that actually we, uh, me, uh, uh, been actively in the council also, we, when we have a chance to talk to the government, uh, authority side, we were trying to encourage them that if you want to plan, you plan ahead so that each of the state, each of the authority plays their part, the statute to allow it. It's just like a petrol station. Imagine that my car, I do not use the petrol anymore, but I'm using the electrical charger. So I need these kind of things with what if my things has been used, finished, you know, you cannot 100, uh, 24 hours or 365 days having a very sun, uh, clear uh, Sunday, so harvest uh, uh, using your solar panels on your car, right? So you need this kind of uh, uh, backup, you know. So uh, I think certain, I think uh, the voice has been heard. It's just that they need other, a lot of these uh, people like us, like professional stakeholders to sit down together, plan it well only and make it work. So we will have to assist uh, people like that to get our country better. It's not just doing your own thing for your own little thing. We can do much more than what we can imagine. So that's what I think my sharing is up to today. Uh, good enough to be uh, carried out as a guidelines to guide you for your studies as well as your practices as an architect. I think thank you for that. I hand back the screens of the platforms to the MC Aris. All right. Thank you so much, <laughs> Alice. As a student myself, I personally gained a lot of new information. Thank like you. other lecture series, they share. Uh, a lot other different information mm. okay so basically i think as an architect landscape architect interior designer or any other roles even as a citizen we have a lot to consider like if you're an architect it's not just the aesthetic of the design you should consider but the functionality and impact that design will bring yep. okay so currently we're trying to achieve this sustainable design due to all the damage that has been done. Mm -hmm. So that is why we all should expand our knowledge and also uh, knowledge on passive design and also environmental factor in order to lessen the burden to our Mother Earth. So furthermore, we can always refer to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, like what uh, AR Alice mentioned actually, like we must uh, appreciate the resources we have because having clean water is actually already a luxury. Not everyone has the access to clean water or electricity. So that is why the method of drainage, conservation of water, recycling that AR Alice mentioned is so important. I hope you guys take note on that. Lah. Okay, so other things that we all should consider is the design ship patterns, urban formatters, and so workability that uh, AI Alice mentioned because this really should be implemented in Malaysia in order to improve our country. So currently, we really don't see so much that uh, that like uh, cycling or anything in Malaysia. So I think uh, if we all have a chance to improve this, we should. Okay, so. Not only in the city we should improve this, we should also uh, make the other uh, other state like maybe Kedah or something to improve as a whole. Is Malaysia not only Kuala Lumpur? Yeah. So uh, okay. So it will be a, the Q and A session. So any of you have any questions? I'll leave a few minutes for you guys to type in the questions. All right, there's one question from An Hui. So, uh, she mentioned in Malaysia, usually the um, mum will selling recyclable waste in Kalanguni, but maybe uh, they have some problem of uh, not having enough space in the house or for the waste sort sorting and storing. Uh, should this be considered in design in the future? Well, I think yes, uh, when doing the, uh, when we're talking about the segregation of the waste, it's not just applying for your commercial area. I think how it's equally important. To be surprising, I, I do not know about your, whether you're aware or not. As I said, 
this pandemic of so COVID-19, when you lock out in your house, you will, then you'll realize that how much waste actually you created. Especially your mom's doing cooking, right? So you, the, the wet waste, waste that cannot be recycled is called wet waste. So you just chuck it out, but you need to segregate. So yes, space, uh, understand that certain people staying in an area, they do not have a luxurious space to do the sorting and whatever. So I think it's really important to really think about that, to incorporate into the design in future. Even the existing also, I, 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 would, I wouldn't say the exist, existing, um, the place that you stay or anybody stay is too late to do that. You know, there's always, if you want to do it, there's always a way to do it. The how, that's how that we play our role as architect, how creative we can do that. If you have a very constrained space, of course the wet, wet ways you have to actually throw it outside because it cannot be kept. Once you keep it, the smell will come out in, I think in one or two days really, especially you cook the whole those uh, heavy gravy things, you know. But things like uh, paper, like newspaper, uh, you buy a lot of things from Lazada or Shopee, they come out with the uh, boxes and everything. Instead of box, you can actually make it flat, so everything arranged nicely. And then a uh, plastic bottle, the same. I think uh, you you don't really have to uh, get a room to do that. You, I mean, you just have to find a space for temporary. Uh, this is the template solution without doing any design into your, your, your house or whatever. That's how you do your segregation by using a different colors of plastic and do it. And then there is, I'm sure there is a, a spot that assigned by your so-called your, your resident management the place this is for this. If you do not have, if you're staying in a place do not have, and I'm sure you have a community uh, community uh, uh, together. So suggest to them, suggest to them that's how when they collect all the so-called maintenance fee to maintain your area, this is the part they need to play. They have to find a place to let everybody, all the residents do sort it out clearly. That's how you create. You can't do it in your house. Then you have to make the community around you together. Let's work together. If do you do not have a community, then you have your neighborhood around. We talk to neighbor. We don't behave like a city people. We talk to your neighbors. Then let's come do something. We choose place and let's do something on that. If you require the approval from authority, please do so. Don't do don't do illegal things. Like that's what I'm trying to say. Do it properly. Segregate, uh, do it nicely, and you might surprise that you can find out certain things that if you approach certain authority that require authorities uh, uh, approval, they might have some uh, free grants things that they will encourage you to do that. Then they might come back and, and, and provide you a free, free, free recycle bin or whatever it is. You know, you do not know because you never go and find it out. So for people have a more luxurious spaces, you can do it well. You can talk to all your neighborhood. So that's how I say the social interaction is very important. Play a part. It's not just a design. We as a designer, we we draw, we create things, we explain very well to your client. But why don't you talk to and educate your people around in your neighborhood? That's how we spread our our education, our awareness. Not necessary in seminars and talks, you know. You know, then you tell them. Then they say, "Oh, really? Yeah." Because you are this profession, they of course they'll listen to you. Because you are more, you are more specialized than them. You have a skill in here. They will listen to you, and then let's do it together. And then a lot of this activity you encourage the relation among all the peoples around your community. That is a good thing that they reach the harmonize. All right. Yeah. Well, I hope that answers your question, Anhui. So next, uh. There's a question from Dan Ah. She's asking for your opinion on the affordable high-rise housing because apparently high-rise housing cannot be built in low cost, but the project PPR is trying to use high-rise housing but mm -hmm. providing bad environment to B40. Does Malaysia has any future plan for this in mixing social that you mentioned just now? Well, yes, yes. And I say that uh, I think when uh, the, I think this is the third, third, third government's right, I call it the third. <laughs> yeah, I think MCO times already changed the government. When it is still the Pakatan Harapan time, the government, uh, we have been talking with few YBs around already. And they started uh, these projects, uh, they call it projects, in selected area because they have to start up with some, some things. First. So they choose the PPR. PPR is an existing low cost area. Many things have been happened. Everybody is saying that their, their income is uh, very limited income. 
and you can imagine if you didn't walk into the PPR, you will never imagine. I walked in before, and it's really you will you will be shocked in the sense that wow, people live in this kind of areas, you know. You, I don't know, but when I look at it, I, I felt it, you know. You can see that, wow, in these situations, um, the hygiene, the light things, everything is not. It's very dark, gloomy, certain area, and then the, the, the basic, I say the basic things that the facility has to be there, there's none. And why um, uh, this YB bring us all about, because there is, uh, this, this cases happens that some, some, some neighborhood, vertical neighborhood doing uh, planting something and the, the, the pots, whatever, is accidentally fell down and it happens as the students walking down, just came back from school, then just hit the head and I, I can't remember whether it's a very uh, heavy injuries or, 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 or causing some, you know, but that is the thing. So that's why that uh, trigger, that trigger the people around that, that's the government side. So they wanted to take this existing, it's not create a new thing, it's existing of this low cost is in high rise uh, form to transform it. It's not to say it's difficult. Everything start is already difficult because why it, in your mindset you think that it's already there. It's, we can't do anything, no. If you have a way to do it, it's always have a way of doing it. You just need people like us to come in to help to solve the problem. If the government gives us a chance for us to come in to advise correctly and everybody's doing it and then we get developers, other other entities to come in, take it as a CSR and do it for once. One block and you let show the, the rest of the blocks all around, then people will start to see that actually things can be done. It's never a difficult. It's whether you want to do it, whether you want to do it and you get people to come to help. As I said just now, Paris has facing this problem I think years back and uh, their government's already uh, aware about this problem. So they started to go and change because you imagine that it become worse until the policemen also dare not go inside, you know. You can imagine how worse is the situation. So then they started to realize that you cannot do this kind of segregation anymore. You want to change. So you have to change everything, the new one, you create, you come up with what I said just now, the, 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 the planning itself must be a balanced picture. That is for the new development, but for the existing, you really have to sort it out by bringing and change the environment. The gloomy area, you bring in more, uh, like I said, try to bring in more the natural lightings, everything. So that's how design can change, you know. Yeah. All right. So uh, the next question will be from Ziyi. He actually agree on the power shift but he thinks it is hard to implement in our country because the climate is so hot and rainy. People here are uh, often choose to travel in cars than cycling bikes. So as a designer, how can we promote this power shift despite the hot climate? Okay, um, I, 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 I just mentioned, I think I was just touched on that, how you can do that. Uh, you, we won't be too ambitious to do it to cover the entire Malaysia first. Let's do it in what we can do is within our area. Let's say I pick up, um, say Kuala Lumpur City. It's pretty hot to walk around. It's pretty hot to walk around. That's why how you can enrich people to walk is to create by doing a lot of different planting, different shades of planting. The trees is uh, natural shading and cool the uh, climates around. That's one. Another thing, if you want to create a walker, walkable area, safe walkable area, walking pedestrian area, you must provide a cover, roof cover, and then with some anti-climb snatching uh, fence so that the robberies, whatever, they won't just drive out their motorcycle and just snatch a thing. So there's a lot of things has been done. There are a few projects that handle us, we are all doing that. Because, uh, like I said, the local governments already aware of that and they started to implement it. So it's very important that one minister from these departments come up with this policy and force and get all the local authorities to play their roles. When the authorities have the this kind of requirements, they will imply to all the new development. So whenever you want to do submission into the departments, whatever they're putting out, you have to comply with this and look at the whole thing. I would think it's good. So we do, and not just for the uh, normal people to walk around even though you have to uh, consider for the disabled people disabled or you always hear people say okay you okay is bahasa say orang kurang upaya but people always thought that it's only the one no legs no eyes cannot hear cannot walk you know but no 
OKU also included Wagga Amas means your grandmother, your grandfather's some walking problems, patient in the hospitals, when you after operation, you have no energies to walk. You need all these facilities. You need the easy access because sometimes because of your weakness, you might rely on the wheelchair. So you will go through the area. What if you bump into some walking area that only normal people can walk to, but not you? And who's going to help you to carry the wheel up just by a few, few mm, you know? So these are the things that, that's why I, I say that you guys as a student, it's a time that receiving a lot of knowledge and uh, looking at all the design is very good. But the sensitiveness and the observation is very important. You always have to think it, not just you, but you have to think you as many people. You are the different user. When you design something, you want to create, if you want to create a place for walkability and you think it's very hot, what should you do? You use the different methods, like I say, wood cover, trees. Yeah. So raining, maybe the trees cannot shape you for rains. Then you do a walker, a very nice cover, very sustainable green roof to let people to walk. Because no choice, we are in the, this tropical country. We're in this tropical, hot, humid climate country. So the humidity is high. We have to create a shade, not just any shade of the cover that the heat gain and then it also the, the heat will transfer to you, you also will be sweat. So you have to create a cool cooling roof to encourage people to walk. So I feel comfortable to walk with the very nice shades, everything's right, and safe. Then people will start to walk already. And then of course not one place to walk too far away. As I said, you need to create, uh, the like you say, you create, the, if you have a piece of things uh, bigger than just a, a building lens, you can start to play around with, I want to create different activities, but I do, as I said, just now all the guidelines, you can use it. Uh, a compact forms with different activities and mixtures of the administrations, of housing, of retail, blah, 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 all these things together. So when I walk around, there are different activities going on. That is attract me. My, my distractions, my attractions of walking very long is no longer with me. I've been paying attention to all this and they are very nice, covered, very nice green roof covered, open, breezy, and I can walk. So right now, of course, no. Right now, you ask me to walk, I also feel very difficult. I need an umbrella, whatever, with, especially with the climate sound. Simply it's because we, we do not have that kind of allowance of the facilities. But good thing is, the thing is that, like I said, already have the policy, already have the requirements that ask all the new developments. At the same time, when you develop your own piece of land, please do things also outside your boundary, this kind of facility. So imagine one lot do it, another lot do it, and then you will connect one and one and one and one, but it takes a bit time. So we also have to think of how to help the existing to become a, a, a place making for everyone. So the guides actually, if you really go through the guide and you can replay back what I'm talking, I think is is all the answers over there. Right? Yeah. All right. So I hope that answers your question. So uh, actually, just now Alvin uh, mentioned that the Park City have this kind of connected circulation. So if you are uh, interested in uh, looking at example of this, you can can actually go visit the Park City. Yes. Okay. Well, I think that sums up our Q&A session. So uh, a very big thank you again to uh, AR Alice. And also thank you for you all uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed it and also gained a lot of insight. So do keep in touch with our Masa's Instagram and also Facebook for the next online lecture. Until then, have a nice night and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.